so it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. This is almost after nine years. So the last time I came here was when I had just finished undergraduate. And I was visiting CMU to try to figure out where I was going to go to graduate school. At the time, I'm, I didn't do a great job choosing. I ended up going elsewhere, not coming to CMU. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's water under the bridge. Well, this time, I'm really excited to be here. And today, I'm going to speak to you about computational approaches for tracking illness severity in infants. So essentially, what I'm looking at is, let me start with a little background. So here I am, a graduate student, about five years ago. This is like just a little bit before Christmas. Um, you know, OK, I used to work, so I'm working on time series data. I love time series data. I love deriving models. We love, um, you know, it's fun algorithms. And we're looking at data from individuals interacting with their desktops and trying to figure out what's the next folder they're going to click at. And you know, that's exciting and interesting, but we thought, wouldn't it be really cool if we could try to use these methods on patients and trying to model patient data? And so that sort of then motivated us to say, well, let's look at patients in the intensive care unit as a starting point. And our clinical collaborators were like, yeah, that would be really cool. We totally have that data. Yeah, we record that data. We know because I see that there's a system. We have to keep inputting stuff so it exists somewhere. And so we can use it on that data. So this is, you know, you guys are all young. You've probably never gone to the hospital. I had never gone to the hospital. So I had no idea. All I knew was there's some cool data there, and I could, uh, you know, the people, the babies who are in trouble, I could help them use this kind of data. It turns out it turned into this elaborate scheme of trying to get the data out of the hospital. We ended up sitting together hacking a system to try to get data out of every device, um, every sensing device, every EMR that sits in this environment. But the really interesting thing was this is what came out of it, right? So this is a real baby. This was at the Stanford. Uh, neonatal ICU. And here's the kinds of data that gets collected as soon as they're born. So right the second they're born, you have physiologic data. So they're streaming physiologic data from your heart rate sensor. So these kinds of sensors attach to the body. So it's uh, uh, oxygen saturation levels, respiratory rate levels. Many of these are continuous. They may be in the ICU for a month. So it's a ton of continuous sense data. You have these lab events. So in the NICU alone, there are over 1,000 unique lab measurements. And these are measurements like the protein level or the WBC or blood gases. Some are taken every day at a certain granularity. Others are taken when the doctor thinks this baby is sick and needs the measurement. There are things like medications and procedures. So when they were done, what was given, what dosage was given, when was the treatment given, what were the results of it. Imaging data, similarly, like any imaging tests that are done. And in addition to that, progress notes, right? So every day they're writing summaries, or any time there's an interaction where they have any qualitative summaries to be written, they write a qualitative summary of you know, why it happened, or what happened, or what they thought. This person went and played football, isn't feeling well, et cetera, et cetera, things like that. And so if you really think about this, this is this really, I mean, actually, until five to 10 years ago, a lot of this data was collected in this environment. Every doctor-patient interaction is collected. But typically, at least as a kid, I remember, they would just write it in some paper, right? And then folder it and shelve it away. And that was you know, the end of that data. And so the point is, you know, when you're doing repeat interactions, when you're trying to see this patient to see what his history is, your recollection of the history is what this person's telling you right now as he's sitting in front of you. So what this opens up for us, as more and more of this data is getting collected, is this ability to look at an individual over time in great levels of detail, but also a whole population, right? A whole population where you have these variety of individuals, <coughs> different individuals may have different disease courses, and being able to understand people in much more granular detail. And so that's essentially what motivated us. And so today, I'm going to talk about a very, very small, specific aspect of this work. It's one line of work. Um, Towards the end of the talk, I'm going to touch a little bit on, on related work that we're doing. And then um, I think I'm, well, I'm around for the rest of the day. Most of my day is busy with meetings. But if you're curious, you can send me an email and we can follow up. OK, so here's what most of my talk is going to be on. So most of my talk, so we've done some work on this data and this data, et cetera. But most of my talk today is going to focus on the continuous sense data that comes out of these sensing devices. And part 
of the reason we started there is this is sort of the bulk of the data. And most of this data at the moment, so this is what the data looks like, right? Like, so this is time over minutes. And this each line here is an individual. And the question is, most of this data at the moment, the way it's analyzed is doctors during the course of care look at the data manually and say, oh, the heart rate's too high, the heart rate's too low. And that's, that's all the scrutiny it gets, right? <coughs> So your natural question is, is there a lot more information in this data that could be helpful and could help me understand and track disease scores? OK, any questions so far? By the way, please feel free to ask questions. Better ask questions now than be lost and wait all the way to the end. So this is my summary slide, because I know Jeff has to leave early. So my summary slide is going to tell him everything he needs to know, and then he doesn't have to feel guilty. So here's what I'm going to talk about most of today. Most of today, I'm going to talk about computational techniques. I'm going to focus on Bayesian techniques, and I'll motivate why for making sense of this kind of time series data. I'll talk about two sets of techniques. That's the bulk of the talk. And then towards the end, I'll talk about this uh, one example application we did in modeling infants in the ICU uh, and doing early prediction of risk. Um, this is Daphne. Posing. Um, and here what we showed was we basically uh, looked at data from the first few hours of life and we predicted which infants were at risk for major uh, complications. And th we found that basically compared to our method, which just uses this physiologic data, and that's this purple line. And then this is the clinical state of the art. So every baby, if, you're, if you were born, you probably got the score. But also if you have a baby of your own, they probably got the score too. And it's called the Abgar. And then these are three other instruments that were introduced since in the last, so this is all 40 years, over 40 years of pediatrics. People have come up with these instruments for measuring risk. And some of them involve blood tests and blood gases. And these premies are small, so you don't really want to take too much blood out. But the idea is we show like how this physiologic data, which is typically thrown away, collected 48 hours later, they throw it away. You can actually use it to do risk prediction. And so that's basically all I'm going to tell you. And all of this stuff exists on my web page. If you want to read it, you're welcome to read it. All right. Now let's dive in. So here's the first two pieces, the technical pieces um, of the talk. So OK, so now imagine you're a grad student, right? So we're going back, and you're sitting there looking at all this data, and you're wondering, like, what, what am I going to, like, what features am I extracting, right? So your natural state of affairs is, this looks like it could be useful, but I have no idea what features to extract. I don't know. So you go talk to your clinical colleagues, and you say, well, do you have any idea what features? So I go try to read and scour some literature. And that might be one motivation for going and extracting some features. But either you're relying on your luck to know what features to extract, or you could be motivated. So that's one approach, and it's a good approach. You should take that when possible. In addition to that, you might imagine you go read the literature, and you, or you talk to your clinical collaborators, and they motivate. They motivate classes of features, right? So here's one example. So, in, in, so before infection, so infection sepsis is like a bad thing that happens. They get infected. And prior to that, often, there are these clinical episodes that clinicians look at. So an example of a clinical episode is what's called bradycardia. So do you guys know what bradycardia is? I wouldn't expect you to. OK. So bradycardia is when your heart dips a great deal. And it basically looks like the shape. So it's like your heart rate is high, and it dips up down for a while, and it goes back up. And it's a very simple undulation in the heart rate. Okay. Another example is apnea. So apnea also looks like another undulation that happens in your physiologic data. There are other examples of undulations that might happen, right? So one natural question, because we're time series people, we asked is, we know there are these undulations that precede uh, clinical events. Could we? build methods to discover these undulations, right? We want to discover this clinical vocabulary, where vocabulary is defined by word, is defined by these shapes that are recurring. So that's how we formulated this problem. And so you can imagine this is not just useful here in physiologic data. If you're looking at handwriting data, very simple example, then your characters would be these uh, repeating structure. Or if you're looking at activity analysis, you, know, you would expect that, you know, a raised leg or whatever, whatever you might do during kickboxing, all of those have like particular signatures that exist in time series data and so on and so forth. So you 
So you could phrase this as a problem of structure discovery in time series data, and so the question is how do we approach that? Okay, so here's uh, more formally, you have your unsegmented time series. It doesn't have to be univariate. I was lazy, I drew one time series, but there could be multiple. Your goal is to discover repeating structures, so repeating structure looks like these repeating shapes. I haven't yet defined to you what a shape is, but let's call these functions that are uh, recurring. And they can be deformed, so they can be deformed in the following sense. So it doesn't have to ap appear exactly. There can be different kinds of deformations that can take place, nonlinear deformations, okay? And your goal is to discover the set of repeating, the vocabulary, which is these repeating structures. Question so far? Good. Okay, so, so there's actually been a lot of work in this area, including work that people in this room have done, in, uh, like Fernando's group. So I'm going to cover this one piece of work only today in the interest of time because it, it's probably the one that's most frequently <coughs> used. And it's work out of EM and Keogh's lab. And what they do is the following. So this is work that is typically, uh, this was published in the KDD community, where you take your data, you chop it off into little windows. Um, so you form lots of little windows, then you use some form of projection methods, either hashing or uh, hashing. So in this particular version, they use hashing to be able to find nearest match, and then they find a nearest match, they call that a candidate cluster, okay? And so we, you can easily imagine, you extend that to say, let's find the candidate as a candidate cluster, use dynamic time warping to find, to uh, match it with all the other windows, eliminate all windows that are within some distance d, restart, okay? So going forward, I'm gonna call this, use this as one of my baseline methods, okay? Um, some of the other techniques that people have relied on are more EM-based methods. So for instance, if you want to do density estimation, you're trying to find cluster centers. Your cluster centers are your motifs, and then you use something like dynamic time warping to match all of these windows to your cluster centers, okay? So those methods all have limitations, and some of these will become apparent as I describe the motivation for how we go tackle this. So here's how Here's the first issue. So often when these time series are generated, it's not the case that all of the data comes from a motif. A large part of the data could be random doodling. So let me give you an example. I'm sitting around, let's say I was trying to do elderly monitoring, right, or like tracking activities in a room. Say I was doing exercises. Some amount of time I'm actually being good and I'm doing the exercise I'm supposed to be doing. And then there's lots of other time and I'm just doodling. I'm sitting around not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So here, that's what this NRW is. So non NRWs are non-repeating random walk states. So what this does is it generates continuous time data, but data that doesn't have any memory. It's just like a single step Markov process, okay? And the model is a switching model that comes from an NRW model and a motif. So your data either gets generated from an NRW state, which is smooth, but doesn't have memory, or a motif state, which has memory by for, uh, for virtue of being generated by the motif. So that when you're dating generated data from the motif, you have a probabilistic model for the kinds of deformations that can take place. So you've probably heard of dynamic time warping. It makes one assumption. But there could be many other deformations that are more likely in different domains, right? Some domains might be more friendly to one kind of deformations versus others. So in this case, here is our assumption. So you can get non-linearly stretched, non-linearly amplified, or locally shifted. So non-linearly stretched, non-linearly amplified, or locally shifted. And so here's an example. So the question is, how do you generate these kinds of deformations? A simple example would be the following. You take the motif and you apply a single factor in front in the time domain, which means it uniformly stretches it, right? But we don't want to, we want to allow non-uniform deformations, so one way to address that is using a Hindmarkov model where you say your warp, so let's see how that could work. So let's say we take the data and we discretize it like that in small delta t bins. When we're generating the data, we just copy the data from the bin you're at, okay? And now what you're doing is you're sampling a warp and the warp allows you to jump through the motif. So the larger the warp you sample, the more you're jumping through, the more squished the signal is, right? So this is a way to probabilistically model deformations, if you will. So that's essentially, it's a prior on deformations. Okay, so now essentially you could use this matrix to sample your warps. Given your warps, you can generate this nonlinear deformation. Similarly, you could 
sample your amplitudes using this HMM matrix, which allows you to do nonlinear amplitude warps and then your local Gaussian, okay? And then the only other piece here that you should be thinking about, okay, so I'll come back to this. Now the reason, why did we use an HMM, right? You could have just sampled something, um, you could have just sampled at each point independently. But this actually turns out really important in practice. So in, in practice, when you're trying to do unsupervised clustering, you're gonna get stuck in all sorts of local minima. And your priors are very, very helpful in pushing you away from bad local optima. And so in this case, the smoothness is really helpful because when you look at real data and you look at what real motifs look like, real shapes, often they have this smoothness constraint. Like, let's imagine I'm, you know, I'm starting to punch, right? And I'm accelerating. The rate of acceleration is smooth. It, it's not jerky, typically, right? So if you plot my, or if I start going from walking to running, the rate at which I go from walking to running, the second derivative of it is, um, so the first derivative is smooth, second derivative is smooth, and that's what it's trying to approximate. Okay, so in this particular case, you can see how I can sample these different matrices and I'm able to stretch and uh, shrink the, I'm able to stretch and shrink the uh, motif at different rates. Okay, so now essentially that's my model. The only other piece that I need to tell you about is, um, so I've given you my piece here, so I'm, I'm gonna use an HMM to do these. I want a band diagonal prior, so the reason it's a band diagonal prior is because I expect my warps to be smooth, and similarly, uh, my motifs need to be smooth functions, and so for that we use piecewise Bezier curves, and again, the reason the, these priors are important is because they help you get away from your bad local optima. So here the number of knots helps you control your complexity, and by having, if you want smooth functions, which is very important in practice, you end up over penalizing these knots, okay? So what are the three priors I used? Not all of the data comes from your motifs. Some of the data comes from these random walk. The amount of your data you want explained by your random walk versus your motifs will be controlled using the H switching state HMM parameter lambda, so that's interpretable. The second one was that I want my curves to be smooth. This depends on the domain, so this allows you to put priors based on what you expect the domain to look like. And then the third is to what extent do you expect your uh, deformations to be, uh, the second derivative to be smooth, right? So this is universally the case that if you look at random data versus data from motifs, band diagonal priors are a good thing, okay? So those are the three pieces. Okay. And so now you essentially just do your, um, you set up your likelihood, you're doing EM, you uh, guess the segmentation, given the segmentation, you learn the model, given the model you learn these uh, priors, and you iterate. Okay, so far so good? Yes? Compared with dynamic time warping, like compared with EPW, uh, what's the biggest difference? The prior, the model? Or? Yeah, so we'll go through that. Okay. Okay, so before, so we'll quickly jump to results. Before we jump there, let's quickly look at how would you compute results. So. This is completely unsupervised so far. If I want to be able to evaluate results, I need to be able to somehow quantify how well my unsupervised method did, right? So in an unsupervised way, so here's an example. You could take your data in an unsupervised way, find windows. So those are the windows I'm showing you. Let's sh show this in the uh, exam. In, I'm doing this in the case of, let's say, handwriting data where I actually know what the labels are, these characters, right? So I would <coughs> want my motifs to be these characters. So now I've written down what each of these characters look like, M, Q, et cetera, okay? So I take my data, I run, un, in an unsupervised way, I find all the motifs. Now on the subset of that data, I have what the actual labels look like. So based on each of the characters, I know where they were windowed, I find what fraction of each of these motifs exists, so red is the red motif, green is the green motif, yellow is the yellow motif, make sense? So all motifs may not overlap with the characters entirely. And that doesn't have to be the case, right? Because you could imagine you overfragment. You allow your method to contain tons of clusters because you think that the domain has a lot of clusters, in which case all you're really trying to do is maximum likelihood estimation. So it's very possible that the degree of variability, let's say in a queue, the first part of the queue and the second part of the queue actually has a great deal of variability, so you're better off explaining that using two clusters. That means you get a red cluster and a green cluster, and all you're really doing here is 
Now for each character, you've learned the class centroid. That is, part of it is explained by green, the other part is explained by red. In your test data, you find each of these windows, you classify based on the fraction of red and green. If indeed you did it correctly, the ratio should look the same, so you will ca classify it as the right character, and all you're really doing is creating a confusion matrix that says, the uh, how many of the cues did I actually think of as cues? Did my motifs discover as cues? How many of the cues did my motifs think were cues but were not cues? Okay, so it's just basically a confusion matrix. Yeah. So we have a uh, data where people wrote. Okay, and the label is the segment in that time series that's a Q, the segment in the time series that's an L, so on and so forth. And now what we're trying to do is we've taken our data and we've formed our own version of these windows, and somehow we have to compute basically if the cues that they marked as cues are well represented using our motifs, right? Okay, so that's how the uh, confusion matrix was generated. And so now some results, and this is to go back to your question of how does it compare. So here what I'm showing you is these two graphs. I didn't speak about how we initialized, so let's focus just on these two. These two are using our method. What I'm showing here is accuracy. The x-axis is um, doesn't start at zero, starts at 30. All the way up there is greedy RPM. That's the first method I showed you as an example. That's using uh, the KDD-based method. And then the next three models, the one in blue, purple, and green, are the models that get rid of one of the assumptions from our model, okay? So we took our model, we're gonna get rid of one of the assumptions one at a time to see how important was that assumption. And the point is your results, the extent to which the results degrade kind of give you a sense of how important that assumption was, okay? So in this case, let's look at the first one. So the three models are CSTM as we're calling this, uh, okay? So CSTM is continuous shape transformation model. I think that's what it was. Anyway, so CSTM, so CSTM no curve prior is essentially saying we don't have the Bezier curves prior, right? So we don't put a penalty on having com complex, complex curves. CSTM uniform warp is essentially DTW. So what would have happened if I had used, instead of use allowing it to learn band diagonal priors and learn these nonlinear warps, I allow uniform warps, okay? So that's the DT, all warps are equally likely. That's the assumption DTW makes. And then, CSTM no warp is basically the same thing except no warps are allowed in this data set. Okay? Make sense? So this is our method. This is the method with no curve prior, everything else as is. Um, everything as is, but just that instead of allowing, preferentially allowing band diagonal priors, you're saying all warps are equally likely, which is what dynamic time warping does. And then the one above says, uh, I don't allow any warps at all. And so you can see in this domain what's happening is that the dynamic time warping actually really hurts performance. And the reason is because there are many, when you're early on, your EM would often settle in a case where it allows anything to match anything, so it gets confused easily. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so we use the same thing in the context of activity data. Here we are looking at um, tracking people over time and we wanna be able to see if we could have recovered what activities they were doing. It's a very simple implementation. In particular, we're just tracking leg movements and we're trying to characterize different leg movements they're doing as exercises. And again, we're showing performance. The interesting thing to note in this plot is that in this case, this was actually, so for instance, in this case, your CSTM no warp didn't make a huge difference, but the Bezier curve prior made a huge difference, right? So different domains have different properties uh, where you can confuse yourself. So here in this case, you had a whole lot of random data. You could easily get confused. In the handwriting case, there wasn't a whole lot of random doodle. Here, there's a whole lot of random doodle. So what was happening is it was easily confusing some of the random doodle as an exercise. The curve prior is helpful in eliminating that. And that's essentially what uh, that penalty achieves you. It helps you get around that that you wouldn't have otherwise got around. Okay, finally, we also apply this to physiologic data, and here in this case, the idea is we go back to the heart rate and we say, can we have, could we have discovered um, vocabulary in the form of shapes, right? So 
Here in this case, what I'm showing you is bradycardia, the initial shape we uh, started with. Here's what some of the bradycardia shapes it recovers. It's very simple. And this is the same shape realigned. And in this, these are some new shapes that they didn't know about before. And so here in this case, you can see that they're actually quite complex. These are aligned. They're not, um, they're shapes that clinicians don't exactly know why they would occur or what they're occurring. It's just that they occur in high frequency. And so now one of the things we're trying to do is as we're getting new data on babies, we're trying to see if we can take this kind of shape vocabulary and match it to downstream events that occur. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk about this towards the end. So typically in the literature, people primarily look at heart rate. There's not very many works in the clinical literature that looks at much more beyond the heart rate. Um, we show a piece of work where we look at the heart rate, oxygen saturation, and respiratory rate levels together. Um, for this data, for example, we only have the heart rate signal. This is data prior to our Stanford data. So it took us a while to get that data. This is the, uh, just done on, this is second to second level data. So this is second to second level data and you can expect to see shapes in the second to second level data. You don't see as many shapes in the minute to minute level data, which is the data we ended up collecting from Stanford. But yeah, so, so the motivation was there might be these vocabulary of things that exist, right? And you want to be able to discover this vocabulary and then being able to relate it to downstream events that are taking place. And so this is one example of vocabulary we um, that we know already there are things like bradycardia and apnea which look like these and can we discover these kinds of things and if we could then you could imagine this as a way to characterize that signal beyond the way they characterize it now and the only way they characterize it now is primarily in two things one is is the heart rate too high is the heart rate too low and then looking at more recently there's been a great deal of work in looking at variability and that's sort of the second way in which people characterize it from the machine learning community and the data mining community in the last two to three years, there's been more and more interest in doing this kind of time series based matching work to, to find motifs. Okay, so this sort of gives my, the first piece of my talk. So I gave you so far is one way <coughs> where I used clinical priors to inform a Bayesian model for discovering vocabulary in, in this kind of time series, right? So these were shapes, repeating shapes. So we go back to our Stanford data and we say, okay, so we go back to our Stanford data. Turns out our data it's from Stanford was minute to minute. In the minute to minute data, the shapes were actually not all that effective, right? So there could be other data where the, it was more effective, but in our minute to minute data, we don't see as many shapes. Instead, here's what we see. Our minute to minute data looks more like this. And in this case, the observation model is closer to what we think is represented using a dynamics. So here's what dynamics look like. So we go back, let's build up a hierarchy. So now we want to be able to relate signal. Mm -hmm. So minute to minute data means one data point every minute? Or yeah, as opposed to pre previously where we were getting several data points a second. I see. So each data point in this time here is just the average over everything that's over a minute. So exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so, so it's actually kind of interesting in its own right. Like there are dynamics that show up in the second to second level, the dynamics that will show up in the minute to minute level. And now there are some pieces of work, you know, you, that are, we're working on that motivate that, you know, you want to really look at hours and model some, you know, the hierarchy in some sense. Okay, so going back to our earlier notion of uh, signatures, right? So here are signatures are regions of this time series that have transient events. We want to go back and relate this to complications. Okay, so here in this case, every color I'm showing you is a transient region. It's a signature, okay? It has slightly different properties. It's not a shape signature here in this form. It may be expressed by another mathematical function. Let's abstract it away as some class, some class of functions that represents that temporal data well, right? All along I talked about shapes. Now I'm going to just abstract it away as some function. Okay, so far so good. Okay, now each of these individuals, when we go back and look at the health records, each of these individuals have their own part of complications, right? So the, unlike, so in machine learning, you typically have classes. You have class one, class two, this baby has X, this baby has Y. Here in this case, you're looking at this heterogeneous cohort. Each individual has its own bucket of complications. 
what you're looking to do is to model the signal as a function of the complications they have, right? So you, it's hard to divide them into A, B, and C because there's not such a thing as this uh, these babies clearly belong in this class and these babies clearly belong in that class. They all had their own set of complications and you're just trying to model how could their data be a function of these complications, right? So let's assume, so now we're going back to our clinical priors and let's assume your data is generated. Here are these transient signatures. You, it might be a good idea, you know, you could imagine that the transient signatures are being generated as a function of these syndromes, right? So whatever syndrome they have, that influences what transient signatures might be generated. And in addition to that, you know that any individual will generate signatures from its own part of complications, but in the population, these complications repeat, right? So for instance, if you see infection. Infection, when it shows up in, say, babies A and B have infection, then you would expect that the signatures for infection might be similar across babies A and B, right? So everything for babies A and B might not match, but its infection signatures might be similar. Okay, so just to quickly reiterate, there's a part of complications, each baby inherits its own subset, given its own subset, there are signatures that might be attached to each of these syndromes that then get expressed within the signals for that baby. Okay, so here's a graphical model that represents this. Each box here is a baby. You have data over time. Um, this is the observed data, this can be multivariate. You have your signatures that then generate the data, a given signature. So you have your signatures that generate the data. So you could use any class of functions. In this case, autoregressive processes represent this kind of signal well. Okay. And now, you could uh, the signatures are being generated given the syndrome. The syndrome at any given time is selected from its own uh, baby-specific part of syndromes. And the signatures are shared across um, these various uh, syndromes. Does this remind you of a model that you might already know? So this is, so some of you might think, oh, this reminds me a little bit of topic models, right? Topic models and documents where you have topics and topics are shared across um, documents. <coughs> Different documents might have different mixtures of topics, right? And if you think about it, this is in some sense, what's happening is here, you don't have words that sit in a discrete space, right? You have a vocabulary, words are given to you, they sit in a discrete space. Here, you're searching in continuous space. There are infinite words, if you will, right? Because each word here is a parameter specification to the signature, right? A signature has a set of parameters that parameter sits in some infinite space of possible parameters, right? And now in this infinite space, you're looking for what are the high density regions. And that's basically your notion of a word, right? So now you, that's, and you want these to be shared. So now the reason this is hard here is because you're searching in this infinite space and you want these signatures to be shared across your higher level syndromes, right? So we use the HDP to do that. We'll just uh, skip that for now because it's just mechanics. You can read about it if you're curious. Now the piece that's interesting here is we use hierarchical base to inherit for any given individual. So any individual inherits its matrix for what complications it has from a population level prior. So your population level prior tells you what's going on. The individual inherits its part of complications from the population level prior. And now to do inference, we use a version of block Gibbs inference. And what that essentially allows you to now do is you run a Gibbs chain, and from your Gibbs chain, what you can derive is you can infer your posterior distribution over what the signatures are, which babies have which signatures when, and which uh, syndromes, which are your topics, exist in which babies when, right? And what, how, what syndromes are associated with which signatures. Make sense? OK, questions so far? Okay, so we do that, and now let's look at some results. So here we're looking at data from a year's worth of data. Um, we basically look at uh, the heart rate and the respiratory rate. All of the results I'm gonna show you going forward in this particular piece of the talk is all on heart rate data again. So again, it's unsupervised, right? So it's unsupervised. 
we posited a model. We posited a model based on conversations with clinicians. This model was about how do you model signatures as a function of syndromes and how individuals are not similar to you have to model the heterogeneity. We use hierarchical ways to model the heterogeneity, right? And now the question comes in, how do you know whether any of these things you've done are reasonable? Like, how do you know that it's a good idea? How do you know? Like, do you have ideas? So one way, one way you would know is you, be, okay, so the standard thing and the thing we do as machine learning people, we say, okay, give us some test data. And on that test data, I can compare my fit to data. So I have some other alternate model assumptions I could have made, right? I could have taken simpler models. I could have taken models that eliminated some of my assumptions that I put in my model and see how well that model explains the data versus my model explains the data, right? So if my model, this new model, explains the data better means it was, maybe some of those assumptions were reasonable. So that's one thing we can do. Um, the other thing we can do is you can take features out of this model, right? So just like in similar to topic models, you take features out of the frequency of topics, for instance. You can take features out of this model and use it as in any classification task and say how well you did in that classification task. Right, that's the second thing you can do. The third thing you can do is because this is a domain that matter, like that has some qualitative meaning, you can go back and understand qualitatively. Does anything my model tell me, does it contradict common sense? Can I go back, talk to my clinicians and see? So in general, I think one of the big areas in machine learning that's a huge issue is basically going, as we're moving away from clearly defined supervised classification tasks is knowing how to evaluate. And I don't think there's a good answer. I think these are all example ways, right? Every piece where you, any piece that works, it gives you more evidence that's a good idea. But there's no definitive answer saying this is a good idea, right? So these are some candidate ideas, right? So here's the first thing we do. We take our data model and we say, let's evaluate it against other candidate models. Okay, because I'm short on time, I won't go into all of the details of these models, but essentially you could imagine an autoregressive hidden Markov model that doesn't model the heterogeneity between the patients. You model it as a single, you let each individual, you don't model the richness that each individual is different from one another. A BPR HMM is another model that was published recently in the literature in 09, I think, that allows you to model variability but does not model the hierarchy of the diseases and the syndromes and the signatures being shared across syndromes. And when we look at the log likelihoods, I wouldn't be showing you the plot if this wasn't true. But essentially, when you look at the test log likelihood, our model has um, um, much better test li log likelihood than the both, both of the BPR HMM and the uh, AR HMM. So let's, um, let's go to the next, next test. OK, so this one I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. So here's what we do. Here's what we're trying to do as a ranking task. So we say, OK, let's t look at our model. and we really want to try to see if we can evaluate if any of the features we derive from this data is useful. So we go back to our clinicians and say, can you ra rate these people from zero to five? Zero means they have no complications. Five means they have major complications of prematurity, okay? And here's a rank score. This is what a rank SVM tries to optimize. Essentially, all it's trying to do is measure if we were to rank our samples based on the features we give it, how well does each model, how well does each form of feature extraction do, okay? So here are the feature extraction techniques we use. So first we take our model, and what we're going to do is we extract the frequency of the latent states. So here the latent states were these syndromes, right, or the topics. How frequent are these different syndromes? That's what we're doing. It's completely unsupervised. So you take those frequency of the latent states out, and you put that as, uh, in as your features into your rank SVM. That's one thing. Alternatively, you could say, I could have used a switching hidden Markov model, right, to generate, to run over the same data, and I could have used the frequency of my eight different AR processes that were used as features. I could go back, I'm, say I'm from EE, and I would naturally wonder, what happens if I use the Fourier features, right, instead of using these uh, features that explain the data in time domain, what if I go to the frequency domain? And then finally, the clinical norm is saying the following. The way clinicians get worried is how, when is the heart rate too high or too low? So what the clinical norm is measuring is fraction of time that you're outside the clinical range, right? So it's too high or too low. So you might imagine the more frequently you're outside the clinical norm, the more worried you might be. So that might be one way of thinking about it, okay? So these are the four features you put in. 
you put it into a rank SVM. And um, here are the results. So it appears, so we do this on the heart rate data and the respiratory data separately, and here's what it appears. It's, it does much better than the clinical norm, which is very gratifying because it suggests that there's a lot more information in this data that's important and interesting and being ignored. It does comparable to ARHMMs, and it does much better to FFTs, right? So one of the issues, the other issues with FFTs is it's, it generates a whole ton of features. It's hard to interpret what's, you know, you, do, you have some interpretation in terms of global, but you don't have this local transient signature-based interpretation, right? And in essence, what it seems is this level of modeling, what collections of signatures co-occur, which is what TSVM is capturing, is helpful. Yes. Uh, is there some interaction between whether FFTs work and the fact where the time scale you're looking at? It seems like they might be more effective on the second 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 view. Ah. So in this case, this was all done in the minute to minute level data. All these models ran on the same data, which was in the minute to minute level data. Yeah. So you could imagine another thing is um, you could imagine using the the Fourier features as a way to, in the times in the second scale as one piece of information and this at the minute scale as another source of information, right? So these are just ways of characterizing properties of the data, right? And here in this case, one thing that it's doing is not just the fact, so the two or three pieces of intuition it's capturing from the clinical literature is that transient signatures, these transient signatures co-occur across individuals based on the syndromes and syndromes might have a collection of signatures that are more likely to occur with it, right? So each syndrome might express itself in a collection of signatures, right? So that's what these features are capturing. The TSTM high-level features are capturing what are the frequencies of these high-level latent states, which is really saying what collections of signatures are you showing more in this infant versus another infant. So finally, we wanted to go back and do the third, like clinically. Can, does this clinically make sense? So I'm actually going to speed up a little bit because I'm running short on time. So here what we do is the following. We can define our latent states to make it interpretable, right? So in this case, what we do is the major complications that exist in this population are either head-related, pulmonary, so lung-related, multi-organ, cardiopulmonary, or healthy, or that they have the absence of these which are healthy, right? So these are your latent topics, if you will, and I have created four categories, healthy head, lung, healthy, and multi-organ. Now we want to give, we want to train this as a partially supervised setting. So you take your data, you take a subset of these. For this subset, you mark what topics they have. And in particular, in this population, what we do is we mark the topics they don't have. That's a form of supervision as well, right? And the reason you mark the topics they don't have is because it's easier to find medical tests that say you don't have this complication than it is to say you have this complication. Because often when you have it, they just do another test and another test and another test and another test, right? There's often uncertainty, then they're conservative. But when you don't have it, it's very easy to rule you out. Okay, so that's the level of supervision. So here's how you would do it in the partially supervised regime. You take a subset of your data, you mark the evidence on what topics they have and don't have. You run inference. Based on your inference, you get a collection of signatures and syndromes. And when they have it, you freeze those signatures you freeze those syndromes. Now you take your test collection of babies, you rerun it with those parameters fixed, right? And now you just, it just tells you for this new subset who has what when, right? So here's some babies from your test set. I've selected 30 babies at random. Each bar here is a baby now, okay? And what it's showing you is eight days worth of data, okay? So there's two days, two days, two days, two days. And each time what it's showing you, each color is the frequency of time during those two days that that signature appeared. So this is saying the frequency of time pink signature appeared in this infant. Frequency of time green signature appeared in this infant during those two days, okay? So it's just taking all of the continuous data, shrinking them, it's doing dimensionality reduction in terms of these signatures, and all it's doing now is changing it into the histogram that tells you to what extent different infants show different signatures during these periods of time. And on the left there, what it shows is each of these signatures, to what extent are they associated with various syndromes. So for instance, one is only occurs in babies who are healthy, five only occurs in babies who have lung-related complications, 
10 only occurs in babies who are healthy. And so, and okay, so now we've, you understand the uh, legend, right? So let's go back and see. So one thing that's interesting, so this is where all the stories come out, right? So you show this graph to these doctors and they get excited because to them, this is interesting because suddenly all that data, that all that up and down movement, which made no sense to them, suddenly when you see it in this form, there's actually a whole ton of regularity that shows up. So here are some examples of regularity. So first of all, it's very interesting that here, there are infants who, are look, who look more similar than other infants, right? Like you can see there's some structure. There's some, some infants that look more similar than other infants, et cetera. Let's do the first thing. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pull out a couple infants and look at them over time, the ones that show the most variability. You can see two of them were discharged, two of them, these two disappeared after two days. We're gonna look at that in infant number three. When you go back, we go back and read the records and we say, can you tell us what happened to these people? And so infant number two here had a major, turns out, so you should be looking at this blue plot, zero is bad, one is good, one is probability being healthy, zero, and this is extracted from the model using, from your Gibbs chain. And infant number two here, he was doing very poorly, he had a heart defect, on day four he went through a surgery, he started to feel better on day seven, he was taken off the ventilator, taken off all medications. You can see just using, phys based on physiology alone, it seems to be tracking his health state pretty well. Infant number 16 here was doing fine. He started to do better and better on day four. He was discharged. Infant 23 was doing well. He started doing worse and worse. And on unfortunately on day four, he died. So that's, um, so this is anecdotal, right? So early I gave you quantitative evidence. Now we're going back and looking at more of the signals and digging in. So this sort of gives them more confidence that this is interesting. The, the signals tend to be tracking the individuals. I won't go through all of them, but we go back and look at more examples. For instance, other diseases, we know their prevalence decreases over time. Do the signatures associated with them, their frequency decreases over time. What do the infants look like? Here is one example one, which is, turns out, these, you can't see, these are red, this is blue. The, the ones in red are all the healthy infants. They didn't have major complications. These are the ones that had major complications of prematurity. So the question was, if you look at these babies that are in the center, they look a lot more similar than these other babies. And in particular, they have more of some signatures than some of these other babies. And so that was interesting and that motivated this risk stratification. So risk stratification was you wanted to be predict, able to predict which infants are at major risk for complications in the ICU. When you look at the data, it turns out three, nine, and 10 are the three frequently occurring signatures. One of the defining characteristics they have is that they have very high entropy. So we just measure this as a simple feature from the heart rate and respiratory rate signals, right? So these are all non-invasive. So everything in box here is non-invasive. So we've now moved on to a concrete clinical task. So a concrete clinical task, our clinical collaborators say, this is really helpful. This is, now can you help us solve the task that we all try to do? Predict which infants are at risk. We're gonna use all the data we got from physiology to compute few simple features and see if we can beat the four tests that they've been using all along, which is CRAB, CRIB, SNAP, SNAPI2, and uh, APGAR. And here are all the other things they tend to use. In addition, they use blood cells, blood gas measurements, and um, our question is, what happens if we try to predict? So we combine this data in some way that's interpretable, takes care into account missingness. I'm not gonna go into that. And essentially, we get to this slide, which shows here is the data APGAR, here is our purple score, and it seems that the physiology contains a great deal of information. Someone asked, what happens? Do you only use heart rate? So this combines, Yusong asked, this combines the three sets of uh, respiratory rate, heart rate, and oxysat levels to be able to do prediction. Now, one might think, okay, this is, I mean, the thing to be thinking about is here's all this crazy cool data, right? So it's all, I mean, for 40 years, they've been practicing medicine in a certain way, where they use these, they're using either these rudimentary methods or they're using all this, you know, they've used the clinical intuition to derive these panels or measures. And the question is, as machine learning scientists, what can we do to look at this difficult data? How can we take this kind of data, combine them to do, um, to do patient management? Here we add all the invasive tests and see if the performance improves, and it doesn't. So the non-invasive signals that typically were collected, thrown away, contain all the information necessary for this task. This is 
the most like final slide. So essentially, this is comparing our method, which is physics score, to all these others and showing that not only does it compute it in time, it's automated, it's non-invasive, and it's highly accurate. So to summarize, I spoke about Bayesian approaches for taking this kind of data, using um, clinical priors to inform search in this kind of data, right? And then I also explained a um, state-of-the-art risk stratification score that we then showed was useful and pretty accurate. I'll end here. Yeah. So this is great. Um, and uh, this is probably not the first time I, I see at least yeah. parts of your talk. Yeah. But uh, I also wanted to say that uh, most of what you said con confirms what we see in our massive scale analysis of uh, I'm curious, many of the, of the research uh, uh, pieces like this um, are basically focusing on some specific set of data. Yeah. It's really hard to get a feeling of how this compares to other methods. For instance, I'm sure you're familiar with the works uh, by Randall Mormon yeah. from, from uh, yeah. University of Virginia. Yeah. And they have commercial, uh, commercial versions yeah, yeah, yeah. of the Hero. Sepsis, um, Sepsis predictor. How would you, um, do, do you, did you have any chance to compare it to head? So his if not, why not using some yeah. commonly accessible data sets, uh, such as Mimic, for instance? To okay, so we're doing that now. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so his thing relied specifically on having really high frequency data. We tried to get the data from their lab at U of V, but they couldn't share that because of what? Well, but you, you can use Mimic, right? It's publicly available. Yeah, so now we're doing this thing where we're going back to create different physiological measures and looking at... Uh, the mimic data set to compare. The mimic data set is actually not very good. I know. So I should probably censor yeah. that. <laughs> well, so it's, it's, it's very good in some ways and not useful in other ways. So it's very useful as methodologists so to try so your the methods. The only good thing about it is that it's commonly available. So yes. you can compare your stuff well, against. That and like you all, see where you have the all data all types, the it's like good to get yeah. familiar with it. But from the mind point of view of doing any, so let me give you an example. Like say you actually wanted to go and compare this method on people with sepsis. Right? One of the criteria for sepsis is having an infection test. But in Mimic, whether or not someone got an infection test is not robustly recorded. So if you wanted to go and evaluate two different methods on it, which is, sepsis is one place where this is being typically published, it's not something you can easily do. Now you don't know if the reason it's not working is because your outcome definition is broken, or it's because, so I have a graduate student struggling with this right now, as I, you know, um, the last two Doesn't months. Various uh, versions of. Struggle. Sorry. Anyways, um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? Students should struggle. That's that's their purpose, right? Yeah. I have another question. You mentioned status and, and how informative they may they may be, and and you showed this LLC diagram of practical overlap between your labs and and yeah. the results that you get with our labs. Uh, and I suppose you are using the lab results. Yeah. Input. How about using lab requests? Oh, I also use that. Oh, you also yeah. use that. Yeah, so the missingness no model takes that into I account. Okay. Yeah. All right, I have no more questions. So in uh, the two models that you show us uh, for time series analysis are generative models. Right? Yeah. So one of the problems of generative models, so one of the advantages, they don't need as much training data as the yeah. generative models. One of the disadvantages is you have to manually specify the kind of feature, like the type of transformation you know, that, uh, that you have to do you allow the stretching time, you allow the stretching space. For one dimensional signal, this might be easy, but when you have multi-dimensional signals, that, that's kind of complicated. So I was wondering if you compare with other discriminative approaches. Eh? So if you want to predict if someone is a risk, mm, a baby is a risk, why don't you map to the label risk rather than... Okay, this is a really good question, and, and it's good that you brought this up because I think it sort of goes back into the whole ethos of the talk. So if if our goal was to just go and do risk stratification, which is the clinical application I showed towards the end, there are many ways to have gotten to this, right? I may have not necessarily started with all the things I started, right? I may have just taken my data and said, I want to compute whatever features I can compute, including features I may learn. I may do some form of sub-dimensional reduction. I can compute a bunch of features and then try to do just try to maximize my classification accuracy. There are two reasons why, so that's 
if that is the task, then that's, that's a good thing to do. Okay. That wasn't our task, but let's assume even if it, that was our task. So okay, that, that wasn't a task and I've copped out, okay? But let me just do the harder version of this, okay? So let's say that was our task. Okay, even if that was our task, one of the other issues that happens here is you have much more, far fewer babies than the space of play data you have and the com complexity of the data you have, the dimensionality of the data you have. So when you're looking to maximize the discriminative objective of that form, you're in this putting yourself in the corner here because um, you know there's way more ease of overfitting, right? That doesn't mean that you can't use some form of supervision. Now, all the structures and files we're giving is also some form of supervision to some extent, right? I just went and I learned about my domain. Now, I learned about my domain to form generalized priors that I think is a, that is a form of supervision, right? It's doing dimensionality reduction, where I didn't take into account the labels against which I would be an, a, you know, in, essentially I saved all my labels. I didn't want to compare against, because if I save my labels, I can use this for actually doing empirical validation, validation. Most of my work then goes into these priors, okay. Now let me answer the third piece, which you said, these priors are actually quite hard to specify. I agree that mathematically they're more work to construct because you have to specify your inference algorithm, you have to write down your generative model, but I actually think they're quite in simple to elicit. So for example, when we were looking at these nonlinear transformations, it's pretty, we didn't have to specify what nonlinear transformations, those were learned from the data, right? All we really had to say is you're allowed to have nonlinear transformations, right? We didn't say what nonlinear transformations, we said, People use dynamic time warping all the time. That's a form of a nonlinear warp. We just realized that just DTW alone is actually not very effective in practice. DTW does not work when you're doing fully unsupervised work. And the reason is because of this thing. I showed you results where it goes into horrible local optima more quickly because it doesn't have, it, the prior, as DTW says, any warp is just as likely as any other warp. We clearly know that is not true in practice, right? So by intelligently, putting band diagonal priors, you're saying some warps are more likely than other warps, and that basically helps you get around those awful local optima. Following on uh, your comment, so we know we are working with physiological data. Physiological uh, data is constrained by the muscles, so the muscles you know, mm -hmm. that we have can move as fast yeah. as they can. So do you think it's possible that we learn? Yeah. Uh, so because right now you are allowing to have deformations that physically are yeah. meaningful. No? Is there uh, any hope? Yeah. Do uh, you have I any thoughts about how we can let, you know, some deformations that, that are constrained by the physical, uh, by the physical work? I think this is a really nice <coughs> question. Um, so when I, when I was giving this talk at Hopkins, there's this huge institute of computational medicine they have there. And one of, and they, their mainstay, so they're, you know, they've done a lot of work in modeling, actual modeling of organ systems and looking at how models of organ systems change with different diseases. And all the way from like the low cellular level, electrical level to the muscle level. And the way those things are often done is prescriptive, right? They've studied the physics of it and it's prescriptive. And so one really interesting thing that emerged out of this is we go from the data and we stretch ourselves a little bit to learn a little bit about what the domain is, right? But we, are, we like the data. We wanna start from the data and we stretch. And in their case, they really start here. They learn, they are prescriptive, right? They really believe in the biology, they really believe in the physics, they're physicists. And then they use the data to some extent when possible, but for the most part, they really believe in the physics. So I think there's this really nice area in the middle that this bridging like absolutely needs to happen. I've just not seen a great deal of work that's making it happen. Yes, make and another PhD student to suffer a little bit more. <laughs> It's actually really fun. It's not all that suffering. <laughs> Does anyone Maybe else? Maybe you have money yeah, right. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. But let's be realistic. <laughs> yes. Oh, I was, a, I was a PhD student not too long ago, so I can resonate. Uh, you guys, on the other hand. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, one in the yeah. back. Yeah, and ways. words, right? You're learning the words here, too. Yeah, it's a way to mention corresponding different patterns. So is it the case you get very different results if you do multiple random initialization? Yeah. Um, so we ran, we ran multiple, we ran multiple um, Gibbs chains. Um, there's actually a written version if you want to go look at this thing. Okay, so there, we ran multiple Gibbs chains. 
when you look at the actual segmentation, so the question is, how do you see how different they are, right? So what is something, how do you even assess that they're different? Because it's continuous stuff, so it's not like words, it's, I mean, this is the issue with all of these Bayesian latent variable models, right? They're hard to evaluate easily. There's no easy way to qu quantitatively evaluate them. Okay. I mean, I guess I was wondering about, particularly the ones that corresponded, those things that look more like X ray rates corresponding to heart rate or things like that. Yeah, yeah. Do you get very different research from that? From right. So, uh, okay. So, when we look at that histogram, that histogram looks very similar. So the aggregate histograms look very similar. The classification results look very similar. So the numbers I showed you, they have error bands around them. So those look very similar. What doesn't look so similar, or I don't have a real easy way to establish similarity, is when you're looking at these individual signals and their segmentations. Because they'll shift a little bit. The colors don't necessarily need to correspond to the same thing. So that's harder to establish. But yeah. isn't there some weak supervision to keep it? I no, we, we showed, I showed you results. In the first case, it was fully unsupervised, right? right in the second case, and in the second case, I added some weak supervision. And that's where I showed you the histograms. The histograms had the weak supervision. Right, and that should grab it a little bit. Maybe. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's when we see the histograms across multiple Gibbs chains okay. on your test data, and that looks um, very similar. Do you expect results to very much if you put this model in front of, say, a doctor and had given them an easy way to vary the, uh, define their own prior? I wish I could do a study like that. That would be amazing. I don't know if they would ever agree to sit. So the issue is, if be because I think they're paid the way they're paid, it's very hard for them to take down that much time to sit down and vary our models around. That being said, I'm going to hypothesize. I still take a shot at trying to answer your question. So. Um, well, so okay, so there are different levels of priors you can vary, right? So you could construct actual, you could construct different priors. So let me give, I assume that at any point you would have only have one transient signature showing up at a time, right? There were no mixtures of transient signatures. And then I also assume that individual syndromes generate transient signatures, both motivated by clinic, uh, apnea and bradycardia, right? I didn't, so I, there are no compositional signatures in other words. And multiple syndromes cannot express these compositional signatures, right? So those would be examples of things you would naturally expect would be things that we should try. Like we should build models that do that. I think, especially if not at the minute to minute level, at the hour to hour level, certainly it'll be necessary. Um, so those are things that they can't do, right? Because we can't easily give them knobs to do that. But then the different kinds of knobs we could give them is what if you varied the amount of this, you know, uh, you have your parameters on the HDP prior, right? That says how many signatures are you likely to have? And also there's a prior that says what's the, you know, average coin length, average word length, right, in this case. All of those parameters at the end of the day you resample, but you could also tweak those. I think it would be interesting to see how much that varies. In this case, we have a ton of data, so the prior parameters are often overwhelmed away by the data. But if you had little data, I do think that it would be interesting to reason with them that, do you think in, the, in IVH, maybe it's more of one type, and this other thing, maybe it's more of the other type. So in this case, for instance, when we vary the parameter, the, we were surprised that the, it's approximately nine to 11 signatures. It never went from to 50, which could be, have been a way, right? Like it, so there was not that degree of variability in our results. Thank you.